everyone has a story. The automotive world is surrounded by some of the most passionate people on the planet. There's builders, collectors, and craftsmen who all have something to tell. is Stories in Steel. With so many varieties of cars in the world, it should come as no surprise that there are just about as many, if not more, unique ways to collect things related to cars. Most of us start collecting long before we can even drive. On this episode of Stories in Steel, Brad heads out to visit the collection of Dave Ellis, a guy who started collecting when he was just five years old. From humble neighborhood kid on Ozzy and Harriet to Jerry Mather standing on Leave it to Beaver, much like Dave, his collection has a story to tell. Well, Dave, I'm, uh, I'm in your house, and this place is, I'm overwhelmed every time I come in here. It's, it's quite amazing. Thank you. When, when did you start collecting stuff? Actually, I, I'll tell you the truth. I probably started collecting when I was as early as five years old, five, six years old. So what was your, what was your thing? I mean, what did you start with? I always liked cars when I was a little tiny guy, cars and trucks and stuff. My mom always worked at a restaurant. She was always a cashier. And she knew a lot of the, the people that owned car agencies in Long Beach. These guys liked my mom and stuff, you know, they became friends. And she would always get me the little promo, one, 125th scale promo cars. Okay. As early as I was that, you know. And that kind of got me started. And then as I got a little older, I started buying, collecting model car, building model cars. It just went on from there. I've always had a love of cars, transportation. And then growing up in the 50s and 60s, I'm originally from Pennsylvania, but we moved out here to California when I was a year old in 1950. And, uh, but we used to take trips back east every couple of years. And we'd always take from LA to Chicago, we'd take Route 66. And back then there was no really super highways or anything. It, you just went on Route 66, two-lane road. Right. And we'd go through all the little towns, through, you know, all the way through the desert, the Midwest, till we got to Chicago. But I was just always fascinated, whether we were driving at day or night, even night, all the neon motel signs and the, the, the gas stations that were lit up with globes on the pumps, the pumps lit up. And it was just, to me, it was just awesome. I mean, I didn't use that word back then, but today looking back on it but that I always had that in my mind and when I was old enough to drive and got my first car and that's when it took off I'll tell you what really started the collecting of the transportation stuff other than cars and stuff the gas pumps the signs and stuff is when I was building my 34 Ford hot rod going to the swap meets buying parts for it and stuff and I'd see these old gas pumps for sale and signs and I said as soon as I get my car built I'm going to start collecting that stuff. I really like it. And like my 10, 15 jukebox, stuff like that. My mom worked at a place in Long Beach, and they had one of those jukeboxes, and she took me in there when I was a little kid. I saw one at a swap meet when I was out buying parts for my 34 Ford, and I said, I'm going to buy one of those so I get my car built, and I did. So you got your very own jukebox when you were, so how old were you when you finally got that? Well, I was in 1980, about 85. Okay. So. It's been a while ago, a long though. Time. But anyways, I just love transportation. I love advertising. Okay. It's the color. It's the, just the, the artwork, the things. It's just, I don't know. I, I don't know how to say. I mean, it's just probably the, the, the most beautiful stuff in the world. Today, everything is just plastic. You know, it's not. Uh, yeah, there's no soul today like no, there used to no. be. There's a lot of collectors, and there's still a lot of old stuff out there. Thank God, you know, that people do collect. But uh, I, I've always had the love for, like I say, anything transportation, especially highway transportation, not so much 
air or water, but uh, really into highway transportation right. and stuff. You know, and that's motels, you know, cafes, restaurants, gas, you know, all that stuff, gas stations. And it all, there's always aver tons of advertising to all this stuff. And it's just, that's what it is. And it's the, the colorfulness of it and everything. That's what really makes it. In other words, it, it makes, it, I don't know about other people, but it makes me happy. So, so the first thing you started collecting you were, were the little 125th scale right. models in right. from, the, from the dealers. Um, because you've got just a collection of a little bit of everything. Off subject for a second. I'm looking at a picture of uh, of you. You were um, you were one of the kids on the uh, Ozzy and Harriet show, which is which is kind of cool. I mean, how did you how did that come about? Back in the 50s, you know, like in 54, 53, my mom had me and my older half sister's picture taken at a, a a studio. Anyways, they had taken pictures. My mom, of course, bought some of the pictures, and they contacted my mom later on and asked if we'd be interested in uh, doing uh, part-time work in uh, sitcoms. Somebody from the studio always talked to my mom, and uh, I ended up getting a part as one of the neighborhood kids in the Ozzy and Harriet show. And I was also standing in all the background scenes for Jerry Mathers on Leave it to Beaver. And I did that from 1955 to 1958. Wow. It was pretty cool. And then like when I was a young kid and I'd go over to we had a thrifty drugstore that was hooked onto a Ralph's Market Bar house. And I used to go over there to buy my models. And I used to buy the little pages, the little car craft and rod and custom magazines. And I'd look through them and stuff and I'd see these guys' hot rods and customs. And I, I used to, you know, my little fantasy was I hope when I grow up I can have bitching cars and get them pinstriped and all that shit, you know. Uh, you know, and maybe I'll get a car and a magazine and all that stuff kind of came true. Not that it was planned, right? it just happened. And I, I, like I say, I just feel very fortunate that I got to be part of all that. So see, even looking at magazines, you got, I mean, you got a magazine collection out there. So you just, oh, yeah. everything is when everything. When I build my models and stuff, I look through the magazines and you know, see what some of the stuff they did on the certain kind of cars. And, right. You know, then I would do that to my models, you know. So it was cool. And you have a good collection of pinstriping, pinstriped, doodads little little signs and I love I love guys that that can do lettering all kinds of lettering I love pinstriping I just think it's the greatest man I, I've always loved it anything to do with customizing a car or truck or you know or just I mean pinstriping and that just enhances things right and you add it to something you know and it's an art you know then I met a guy named Steve Bowman when I was in junior high school. He was a couple years older than I was, and I uh, <clears throat> started hanging around with him. He had a car. In fact, he was driving a car to school in ninth grade because he <laughs> flunked a couple of years. He, he's the one that first took me to a place uh, called Gene's Muffler Shop in Paramount. And the guy that owned Gene's at the time was Keith Christensen. He was a big influence on my life with cars and stuff because uh, he always did, always lowered all my cars, did the muffler work on it, put my duels on and stuff did the drive shaft chrome tips or bell flowers, what some people call them. But then one of the best custom car painters back in the day had his shop right across the driveway from Keith's Muffler Shop, and that was Larry Watson. He was a custom car painter. So I got to, when I was at the Muffler Shop, I got to watch Larry work on these cars and stuff. And then there was a pinstriper named Jules Canute that used to stripe out of Keith's shop. People would bring their cars, and Keith made a little spot for him in one of the garages to so he could stripe cars and stuff. And even before I drove, if, if I wasn't somewhere with Steve, I would ride my bike. I rode my bike to a place in Compton called Custom City. And they had a, 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 a motorcycle shop there that sold any kind of motorcycle you could think of. And right next to Custom City was the very first original service center. And they did muffler work there, they lowered cars, they did louvers, and when you walked in there, there were all these engine stands with these built flathead motors. Some had them with three twos, some had them with blowers. And they had all the fin heads, you know, the, all the different Edelbrock and Evans and all the, you know, the popular, you know, speed equipment stuff back then. And then when you walked up to the counter to talk to the one of the salesmen, all in the back wall was nothing but car club plaques from all over Southern California. 
And that was another thing that got me. So watching. that was an inspiration for your car? Yes. Car clerk flags that you have. Cars. Okay. And then Steve Bowman also was the one that took me to the drag races for the very first time back in 1963. And he took me to Lions Drag Strip. And I was hooked. You know, if it wasn't for him, I'm not going to say I wouldn't have done the things that I've done, but uh, he kind of introduced it to me when I was young. But then, like I said, I used to ride my bike around a lot of these hot rod shops in the summertime when I was, uh, you know, school vacation. You right. know? Got to meet a lot of, a lot of great guys. A lot of guys, you know, there's a lot of guys at Pinstripe do lettering, and they're they all got a great talent. You know, people say who's the best Pinstripe? Who's a, you know what? They're all the best in their own their own way. Absolutely. You know? No one person is, you can't say one person is any better than the other person, you know. Right. You know, they all have their own way of doing things. And a lot of these guys that have been doing this all their life has been a big influence on me. They don't even care that they're, I mean, they're popular in the hot rod circle. And these guys are some talented people that should be recognized, you know. So yeah. how many how many cars, how many cars have you had? Do you even, do you even know? <laughs> well, I can't give you an exact count, but I've had over... Probably 35 cars. So you've had a few cars in your, have, in your history. and trucks. Okay. I used to buy old trucks and fix them up too. I bought stuff that looked like it still went to the junkyard. When I got done with them, you know, people wanted to buy a Nice car, sure. Yeah, you know, they all had pinstriping on them. <laughs> that's awesome. And chrome. I love chrome. You love chrome. That's that's a huge part of your collection. There's a lot of shiny. In fact, my daily there. driver truck, my 86 Chevy pickup, I even had, the, there was a place in Compton called Dave's Home of Chrome back in the late 50s and into the 60s. And there was a place where you could go buy chrome wheels. You could even go in there if you had a popular model car, any popular model car, you know, all the window moldings inside around the windshield and the doors and the back window, you could trade your painted ones in for chrome ones and pay the difference. Right. They even had that glove compartments, you know, chrome, the ashtrays, because guys used to get all that stuff chrome. That was... Just something to do back in those right. days, you know. Okay, you have also have a huge collection. I'm looking around at the license plates. That's that's a huge thing. You probably got more license plates than anybody I've ever seen. What I don't have is I'm not the I don't have the most, but I'll tell you how that got started. I've always liked license plates. I never really intended to collect as many as I have today. When I was 15 years old, I got a job at Parkwood Chevrolet in Lakewood. I was a lot boy, and I, I used to detail the used cars, wash them, you know. And, and when somebody traded in a car, I took the, if it had license plate frames from another dealership, I would take them off, put the Parkwoods on, and I never threw the other ones away, I kept them. I had boxes full of them in my parents' garage, because I lived, I was still in high school at the time. Right. And when I moved away from home, when I, I graduated when I was 17, when I moved away from home, uh, I didn't really take anything out of the garage. And my mom saved them. She never got rid of them. And then I started collecting license plate frames way before anybody else did. And I was going to make a display of them. And let's face it, the license plate frame doesn't look good unless you got a plate in it. Right. So then that's got me in, that got me into collecting So that's plates. how the plate thing came around was from yes. the frames. And any time I find a frame from out of state, I'll find the plate that should be in that frame. In fact, sometimes I'll get a frame and it'll say, like I got one right down here. It just said some dealership, Pittsburgh. Well, there's a Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There's a Pittsburgh, California. And there's a Pittsburgh, Kansas. Well, how do you find the right one? Well, I take the plate and you got to match the... See, today, from 1956, most of the states had the same size plate with the right holes. Okay. But before 56... Every state was longer, shorter, taller, skinnier. They were all different. So when I bought a frame and I was looking for a, a license plate for it, I had to, had to match measure the holes. the holes and stuff. And when I went to the swap meets and stuff, I had to measure the holes to make sure it would fit that frame. And if I didn't know what town it was, say I already had a, say I had a Pennsylvania, a Pennsylvania plate, say Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Right. And I tried it and that didn't line up, so I knew it wasn't Pennsylvania one. So then... I tried the Pittsburgh, uh, California plate, nope. Tried Pittsburgh, Kansas, that's what it was, a Kansas plate, a 40s Kansas plate. Awful, see, I, I But never, what I'm saying I is about that, 
there's all kinds of it ain't it, it's kind of interesting to do because it ain't like you just go out and buy any plate at all to fit that frame you right. got to find the right ear and everything else and that pretty much tells you how old that frame is you know if you buy have to buy a 40 a 47 plate to fit that frame right That's, you know but that that got interesting that that so that made that part of the collection even more interesting and then i collected all 50 states of course in 49 Alaska and, and Hawaii weren't states, but they are now. But I collected all 50 states in Washington, D.C. in 1949, my birth year. And my goal on that is I'm collecting all the frames to fit all those 49 plates, you know. And I've got about half of them collected so wow. far. It's just, you know, it's like you never run out of things to do with your collection. I mean, if you put your mind to what, you know, what you're going to do. It's like car club plaques. I used to just collect Southern California ones, but I collect them from all over the United States. But as time goes on and things go on, you don't have enough room. I like to display my stuff. I don't want it in boxes. That ain't no fun. Right. I want to display it so people can see it and enjoy it. So over the years, I've sold a lot of my, sold a lot of my car club plaques and stuff. But you know, if I see one and I didn't have it before, a lot of times I'll end up buying it. I still collect. I have no room for anything, but I still collect. I, I end up making room. Is there is there anything that you've collected over the years that you wish you wouldn't have sold? Oh, or if, oh is there tons of stuff <laughs> that you wish you would? But you know, Brad, I didn't to? have any. I didn't have any place to put it. Like I say, I don't want to leave stuff in boxes. Right. Nobody can enjoy it. I can't enjoy it. That's the thing about collecting, especially when you collect advertisement, anything to do with transportation restaurant you know i even collect menus from all the old car op places and stuff if you can't display the stuff I mean, what's the use of having right. it and and i like to share it with people because i'll tell you what when people i used to have a barbecue every year here and when people came over we used to get about 75 80 people in all ages from kids all the way up to older people my age which i'm almost 70. just to see people when they walk into my building or walk into my house and they look around and they get a smile on their face. That makes it all worthwhile. The kids will go, wow, did they really have stuff like this back then? Why did they do this? Why? I said, because they didn't have television back in the old days. They couldn't, they had to advertise by sight. They had to make, they had to show their advertising, the brightest colors, the light shit that lit up the most, you know. And, and I've got stuff from anywhere from back in the 20s or the teens all the way up into the 90s or 2000s. I mean, uh, I, you know, I do collect newer transportation stuff, a little bit of it. And uh, each generation, you know, when they see something, it reminds them, I guess, of the good days because they wouldn't smile if it didn't. I'm sure they'd have a frown on their face that reminded them of something they didn't want to remember. I don't know, it's just such a positive. All this stuff's a positive.
it's funny because you collect a little bit of everything. You, you walk around here, it's like, I, you know, you got, you got all those magnets on your refrigerator in there, you know, lots of magnets. You, you showed me your water slide decal collection. Which I love that stuff. That's that's definitely up there. In my, well, that was another thing when I used to go deal. to Lions Drag Strip. I always had a couple extra bucks with me because I'd buy. You could buy decals for ten cents. The old water transfers. Right. And when I went to Lions, I I'd, I'd buy at least ten or fifteen decals, different ones every time I went. You know, because they had hundreds of them. You know, all the sponsors of the race cars. You know, wheels, manifolds. You know, blowers. Right. Everything you can think of. You know. They had a bitch and colorful decal. There again, the colorness and the neat little pictures they used to be on them and stuff. The colors you know? what sold you. That was your thing. Oh, yeah. All the colors. I mean, I remember the first time I seen Big John Masmanian's A-Gas Supercharged Willys. Bright red with beautiful lettering on it and stuff. Hallow brands all polished and stuff. I just thought that was the greatest thing in the world. The color was beautiful. Oh, man. I never got to see the original I, like you did. Oh, it was a little little before me, but that car was a beautiful beautiful car. Well, it wasn't a candy red one like I got a model of over there. This one was a, just a bright red, you know. It, it was a bitching car. He always had really pretty stuff. Canning, Gary Canning, who was in a club called the Tridents. And Gary ended up being a promoter of uh, car shows. He had shows at all the major arenas in Southern California. L.A., Sports Arena. Long Beach Sports Arena, San Diego Sports Arena, the Orange Show in San Bernardino. And, he had uh, one in Victorville one time. Yeah, remember, he did. I remember going, remember going to his and stuff. And then Gary the started doing a show in Pasadena years ago called the Loose Change Fun Fair. And all they sold there was jute boxes, Coke machines, Pepsi machines, Dr. Pepper machines, scales, anything to do with coins. Okay. You know, but then also... Since they sold jukebox stuff there, people had the old 78s and 45s and albums because, you know, some jukeboxes played albums. That stuff. Movie posters. Old cowboy, any kind of movie posters and stuff. And they're very colorful and got beautiful artwork on them. So it's just, I just love advertisement, I guess you could say. I have a love of advertisement. And anything that's affiliated with it. And there's a lot affiliated with it. And it's major stuff that we need in our lives. Transportation, food, place to sleep, you know, talking about motels and restaurants right. and stuff, you know. So I grew up in that era when there wasn't super highways, you know. When you were going to go back east or the Midwest, you mainly took Route 66. That was the big deal. I was fortunate to grow up in that era. And drive around. And I guess you could say I took advantage of it by living my life with it, you know what I mean? Like I say, Brad, I I can thank my mom, I can thank a couple of good friends that kind of helped push me along with this thing. But I'm the one that, when I was old enough to get on my own and drive and stuff, then I took over and did what I, I wanted to do. Right. And I always said I want to just collect. Someday I want to buy a place. I'd like to build a big building to put my collection in maybe build a little gas station, not one that's usable, just one. And where my friends that are in, in my car club or whoever, friends of mine that have old cars or whatever, they can come over and take pictures of my place and stuff. That's what I want to do with it. And that's what, I, that's what it, I built it for, you know. You know, it's kept me from drinking, from doing drugs. I mean, not that I would have done it. I'm just saying right. this thing has kept my life clean and you could, happy and you couldn't afford to drink and do drugs <laughs> no, exactly and i'm glad you know i don't regret anything that uh that has to do with what i what i've done with my this has always been a hobby i i just couldn't think of any better way i would have wanted it wanted it i kind of lived lived my dream you know it's not a big thing to a lot of people but it's a big thing to me you know sure back when you were when you were younger you were you were hanging out at Lions Drag Strip, and every Saturday night I went to Lions Drag Strip. Even before I was driving, if if Steve didn't have his car, we would actually hitchhike. We didn't live that far from Lions, but we would hitchhike to Lions, and we'd get a ride home. And we always got a ride home with some drag racer. Like there was this kid from Bellflower named Les Allen. His family, they had what they called, uh, damn it, what's the name of those cars? They were little injected injected small block Chevy uh, dragsters. 
Oh, Les, like junior fuel? That, junior fuel, okay. that's what they were called. Okay. And Les Allen drove the car for his parents. He was a teenager. He had an old beat up 53 Chevy four door. And almost every time that we needed a ride home, we'd be standing out by the entrance to Lions. When he was coming out, we'd drop in his car. He'd drop us off in Lakewood on his way to Bellflower on the way home. That was kind of cool. And then his younger brother, Jeb, who was just a little, little short stock, little chubby guy, used to be with them at the drags. When he grew up, Jeb Allen, and all their cars were named after insects. Praying Manus was Jeb Allen's car. Yeah, and their junior fuelers were the Wasp and the Stinger. And then Jeb Allen got that Revell sponsorship, and his car was called the Praying Manus. Yeah, when I was a kid, he was huge. He was... I got some of his memorabilia out there. Yeah, he was the guy. Yeah. You know, when I grew up and got married first time, I lived in North Long Beach, and there was a muffler shop in North Long Beach, and there was a Tom's muffler by my house. And I got to be, I used to go to Tom's every once in a while because I did roofing for him. He owned a lot of properties, you know, and I did his roofing. Well, Tom had a, a dragster, but it was a six-cylinder dragster. In the final, every Saturday night at Lions, he would race a guy named Ike Icono from San Pedro. Same guy. It was just those two in the final round. Yep. There was another guy I, I met doing roofs named Paul Gomi. Okay. And he's a big Ford hot rod guy. And he's also been involved in drag racing. But how I met Paul was through my, my roofing business. I used, he had a lot of rentals and stuff. I used to do all of his roofing work for him. And I got my own, I started my own business, got in business. You just keep meeting more people. Okay, like <laughs> when I first got out of high school, I wanted to become a roofer. I wanted to get in the roofers union. Well, you can't join a union until you're 18. Well, I graduated when I was 17. So what I did, I got a job driving a truck hauling roof material. And they needed another guy and they hired this guy. He was a little older than me to come in. And you know, we had these, what they call scissor bed trucks. The beds would lift up, okay. you back up and lift it up. You could walk right off the bed of the truck with the shingles and load them on the roof. Well, they hired this guy named Danny. They told me to take him out and show him how to work the truck and make sure it was level and how to tie off loads because he'd never done that before. So he was kind of new at it. Well, anyways, when we're driving down the road that morning, he, I took him with me and he started asking me questions like you're interviewing me now. He said, uh, you ever go to the drag races? I said, yeah, I go all the time. I love it. He goes, you ever heard of a guy named Gary Gablich? And I said, yeah. He goes, do you know him? I, I said, no, I don't know him. I said, but I see him at the drags, drive top fuel cars, you know. Right. I said, I've also seen him at Marine Stadium do, driving drag boats too, you know. He goes, well, he's a good friend of mine. I went to school with him. And this guy was kind of a goofy guy. I didn't know whether to believe him or not. So anyways, at the end of the day, we went back to the yard, you know, we got done doing our work. And he said, you want to meet Gary sometime? I said, yeah, I'd love to. He goes, okay. He said, I'll set it up. So he introduced me to Gary Gavlich. They were wow. friends. They were good friends. You wouldn't know it because there's so much. Different so personalities. Different, you know? Yeah. I mean, Danny was a funny guy after I got to know him and stuff. But uh, that's how I got to meet Gary. And uh, Gary was just a sweetheart of a guy. I like it was a stud. I guy drove everything. I mean, come on. Well, you know, he used stud. to do all that testing, too, where they spin you around a million miles an hour in the oh, space program. I didn't, I didn't know that. Oh, Gary did all that, yeah. He was nuts. So he was nuts, yep. <laughs> you know what he wanted to do one night? He wanted to ride those, you know those guys that, uh, on the motorcycles? He wanted to ride all the way through the quarter mile, holding on to the seat on his feet, put those steel plates with boots. Just to see if he could do it? He wanted to do that, but they wouldn't let him do it. Yeah, he wanted to go a quarter of a mile on his feet as oh. fast as that bike went. If oh. the bike went 120 or whatever. But like I say, they wouldn't let him do it. You know how you say sometimes you're in the right place at the right time? Not that it was planned. You just happened to, you know, just like I told you my dream about having a car in a magazine. When I, when I built my 34 and finished it, the, a couple of my buddies asked me out for the Early Times Car Club, and I got in the club. I even became president of the Early Times for a few years. Uh, had people coming up wanting to do my, you know, 
freelance photographers wanting to do feature my car for the cover of Hot Rod or whatever. Right. In fact, in fact, Larry Woods, the guy that worked for Mattel all those years that designed a lot of the Hot Wheel cars, was in, you know, he uh, he asked me he wanted to do a cover shot. Did it? They had a contest. Street Scene Magazine, which you got to belong to the National Street Rod Association to get the magazine every month. Right. And uh, he, he said, Dave, I want to do a, a, a photo, send it in, see if we can win, a, a, to get your car on the cover of Street Scene. And I said, well, yeah, no problem. I'd love to. He goes, you know anybody with a big semi truck with a lot of chrome on it? I said, you know what? I don't. I said, I see a lot of those trucks, but I don't. And, he was talking to me at the car club meeting and there was another guy there, Dennis Manifer. And Dennis had a neighbor kid named Darren that had a truck that was all chromed up, you know, factory. So we got a hold of him. We all met out at this old trucking company out in Dominguez. And uh, they took a picture of that truck behind my 34 Ford with all the, and Larry used all these uh, star filters in his camera. Right. You know, to make all the chrome. And we won the contest, so I got my 34 on the front of Street Scene magazine. And on the cover of Hot Rod magazine, uh -huh. which is a big deal. That's it is to me. Well, Hot Rod's kind of because the Because I used to buy Hot Rod when I was a kid. That's the granddaddy of all yeah, the magazines. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's the earliest Hot Rod magazine it was. Well, you've definitely had quite the life. I have. I will say. You've I've met a lot of neat people. And, you know, and, you know, just getting back to talking about pinstriping is what... That was, that's your? That's well, you your and deal. I met, yeah. And uh, a lot of these guys have done work for me, and, you know, done things for me. And I've, I've ended up becoming friends with all of them. And I'm talking about Dennis, you know, Rick Lips. I mean, I used to go hang out at his shop at night that he went to after his regular job just to do his side, just striping work and stuff. At that time, Dennis was working at Norm Reeves Honda. He's one of my heroes. We've been friends for a long time. He's one of my one of my heroes. Dennis is a great guy, and he's he's one of the. I mean, he was around when it all yeah. started. You know, right in the middle of it, right there in Southern California. Well, thank you, Dave, for uh, showing me a little bit about your life. Well, thank you. It's been, thank been you. Quite amazing. I, it's just uh, like I say, I, I wouldn't have had it any other way. I got to do what I wanted to do. I'm still kind of doing what I want to do. You know. I mean, I'm not a rich person as far as monies go or anything, but I've just been rich in being able to meet the people I've met in my life and do a lot of the things and collect a lot of the things. And, you know, what can I say? I'd like to live forever. Stories and Steel intro.
Take 14. Up next on Classics of the Postmodern Era, the London Philharmonic Orchestra presents... Up next on Steely's and... Uh, <laughs> come on. Is this the episode with all of the sparks? Now with 30% more story. Driving on Route 66 as a kid, he was probably arrested because he didn't have a license. He was Ozzy's stunt double on... Ah, uh, for Christ, he was Ozzy's stunt double on Jerry Mathers' Leave it to Harriet. There's a very thin line between breakfast cereal name and a trip to HR. I hope you didn't pay more than a dime for that light filter. Teleprompter? Meet mouth. What if we did an entire series where it's like uh, just filmed in real time? It's a collector in real time doing his collecting thing. Kind of like the Truman Show, but then for like two weeks there's a slump in the ratings because he gets the flu. Next time on Breaking Wind, what's your favorite consonant? Do you want to do the dejected sigh or do you want me to handle it? I'd like to give a big shout out to the person typing in the closed captioning. I think my teeth are tired. For more stories and podcasts, go to www.round6pod.com. Round 6 Pod.